What's happening everybody? It's Sean with Reactions to the Classics and today we have a full album reaction for Father John Misty, I Love You Honey Bear, brought to us by our friend, longtime patron Josh and also super fan of Father John Misty. We do live streams on Twitch every Wednesday and Friday and every Friday night pretty much like clockwork. Josh usually brings us a Father John Misty offering and we have greatly enjoyed that. So looking forward to diving into this album. We've actually done Pure Comedy, which is up on the channel as well, a full album review of that for Josh. So before we get started, if you'll give it a big thumbs up, hit the subscribe button below. And if you'd like to be a patron and support us in any manner, check out the Patreon link below. We really appreciate it. Let's dive into a little background on this and then we're going to get after it. It was released in 2015. It was his second studio album, debuted at number 17 in the U.S. It was produced by both Josh Tillman, who is Father John Misty, and Jonathan Wilson. Uh, I don't know if I want to call him Josh or Father John Misty, right? Josh described it as a concept album about himself. It deals with his personal life, including him, quote, engaging in all manner of regrettable behavior. I think most of us can, uh, can relate to that, as well as his relationship with his wife, Emma. Because of the album's raw personal nature, uh, Father John worried about playing the songs live and initially had a hard time playing those songs for people who were close to him. Uh, in January of 2015, he launched a fake music streaming service called Streamline Audio Protocol, where he uploaded a lo-fi version of I Love You, Honey Bear for streaming. The version includes the entire album without vocals and other instruments featured in the actual release of the album. Uh, Tillman describes this service as something where, quote, the consumer can decide quickly and efficiently whether they like a musical composition based strictly on its formal attributes enough to spend money on it. Giving you a little sneak preview without giving you the whole main course. And, and Father John Misty, a.k.a. Josh Tillman, said this about the album in the album announcement that the record label Sub Pop actually released. He said... I Love You, Honey Bear is a concept album about a guy named Josh Tillman who spends quite a bit of time banging his head against walls, cultivating weak ties with strangers, and generally avoiding intimacy at all costs. This all serves to fuel a version of himself that his self-loathing narcissism can deal with. We see him engaging in all manner of regrettable behavior. The critics really like this one. Metacritic, 87 out of 100. If you don't know what Metacritic is, it just takes all the critics' reviews, puts them in one composite, rates them. A perfect album would be 100. Nobody gets an album at 87. It's crazy high. All Music, 5 out of 5 stars. Mojo, 4 out of 5. NME, 9 out of 10. And Rolling Stone, 4 out of 5. All songs are written by Josh Tillman. So all that out of the way, Let's get after it. So before we get started, just a reminder, the music will not be on here. However, there is a link below. Click on that if you want to listen along with me. If you just want to know what I think, just uh, stay right here. I'll have the lyrics up as always following along. Some artists, that's really important. Some, not as important. Uh, for Father John Misty, important because he's, he's a smart guy. His lyrics are always really intelligently written. We're going to start out, as you see below, with the title track, I Love You, Honey Bear. It introduces the listeners to the relationship between Josh Tillman, once again, remember, that's Father John Misty, and his now wife, Emma. It has been a part of his live set, I found this interesting, since 2012, so Josh wrote this a long time ago, but three years later, it pops up on this album. The title track, I Love You, Honey Bear, written, as I said, to Emma, it appears in this that Emma kind of has the same attitude as, as Josh does, or Father John Misty. Um, just from the lyrics, but he says he'd never called her Honey Bear. He's never called anybody Honey Bear in, in his life, but that he wanted that to be the title of this song and the title of the album so people knew that it was going to be a much more personal album, a, a bunch of emotional glop, as he put it in this interview that I was reading. But he, he basically talks about, you know, Honey Bear, Honey Bunny, Honey Bear, um, F the world, damn straight malaise. It may just be us who feels this way, but don't ever doubt this. My steadfast conviction, my love, you're the one I want to watch the ship go down with and basically says he's not really happy. They're not really happy unless they're with each other as they just watch everything else burn, sort of. Course one, everything is doomed and nothing will be spared, but I love you, honey bear, honey bear, honey bear. And, uh, second verse, just talking about how they're kind of alike and how the neighbors are watching them, uh, you know, do certain things and judging them for it, but Chorus two it ends. There's not a lot of lyrics, even though it's a four and a half minute song. It's a slow unroll, you know, a slow rolling song. 
Uh, but everything is fine. Don't give in to despair because I love you, honey bear, honey bear, honey bear. So I think at the end of the day, he's telling her, look, we got each other. We know the rest of this stuff around us is kind of doomed, but it doesn't matter because at least we're with each other. He uh, he did address this a little bit. He did an, a, a couple different interviews for this album that I read. And in one of them, he says, this uneasy world-hating attitude is one that he avoided during his stint in Fleet Foxes. Describing that experience as an anesthetic, he said he found inspiration from his true personality. He said, quote, just be me, he recalls, the real me, the sarcastic, overcompensating a-hole. That's the bigger-than-life character. Being a tortured artist is meaningless. And I read you that quote because I've heard a lot of Father John Misty. I'm not authority at all, but not Josh Tillman, but Josh, our patron that brought this. Yeah, I, I'm sure, I think I've heard this song. I think he's requested it on live streams. And I respect Father John Misty because I think he writes about a lot of real stuff. Um, he's an atheist and I'm a Christian, and I'm sure that's going to unfold in here as he mocks religion at times. But it is what it is, man. It doesn't mean I'm not going to rate this high. But that that quote from him, the real me, the sarcastic, overcompensating a-hole, that's the bigger-than-life character. That's how I view him. I don't really care for uh, his personality or the way he presents himself that just over the top, I, you know, I think all of us have been around people that way. And maybe you are one of those people and maybe you love that, but I'm just being transparent here. I don't really care for that. I think it's disingenuous and uh, judgmental. Like I'm gonna judge all this stuff, but don't judge me. That's the only time where I run kind of counter to, to what he's doing here. However, I still will give this a totally honest grade. I liked pure comedy and I was curious to do this one. That's why I chose to do this instead of Trey, my, my partner in crime on this channel, because it did interest me when I researched this and saw all the personal stuff. So all that aside, I enjoyed this song. Now we're going to move on to a shorter song, Chateau Lobby number no. four, NC for two virgins. And this is the part where, where Father John Misty, you know, is pretty clever. It is about Tillman and, and of course his wife Emma exploring Los Angeles when they first met second single from the album in another interview he said it's about emma and i running around la when we first met this mariachi band on the song is part of the atmosphere here in la you just hear it in the air in addition to referencing an iconic hollywood touchstone the track's title winks towards leonard cohen's song chelsea hotel number no. two got some cohen stuff up on the channel which also describes a sexual liaison in a storied hotel famous for its artistic guests. Additionally, the song's subtitle references Unfinished Music Number no. 1, Two Virgins, the debut album by, of course, Beatle John Wennon and Yo his future wife, Yoko Ono, recorded the night they became a couple and right before they had intercourse with each other for the first time. So that's what I'm saying. Like, Father John Misty is, is really clever and really smart and, and these little word plays and these things. I'd rather do enjoy, so let's get after this one. Chateau Lobby number four. I like the horns, I like the strings. There's a lot going on arrangement-wise in this song, less than three minutes long, but uh, sophisticated on the arrangement and the instrumentation, really enjoyed that. Enjoyed the little mariachi band before the last chorus in there, that was nice. Uh, as far as what it's about, I mean, it's, just, it's about Emma, man. I think it's obviously gonna be a recurring theme on here. Emma eats bread and butter like a queen would have ostrich and cobra wine. He said he made that up, just, you know, the ostrich and cobra wine. We'll have satanic Christmas Eve and play piano in the Chateau Lobby. I think that's one of those things, once again, I'll go back. You know, I'm a Christian, and if you're not a Christian, you know, that's fine. But I think when you openly mock it and come at it, and I know he does it for controversy, but uh, that's a part of it that I don't really care for. Um, it's, it's a little pretentious, but hey, the song itself, Really good. In verse 2, he says, lift up your wedding dress. Someone was probably murdered in. So letting you know it's it's a secondhand dress. Uh, dating for 20 years just feels pretty civilian. He, he married Emma after they've been dating for two years. And I've never thought that, ever thought that once in my life, you are my first time. People are boring, but you're something else I can't explain. Here, take my last name. And I read when they first had a drink, which is two months after they met, he said he just was in that in that first time having a drink and re realized that they were on the same page. He's like, I want to spend the rest of my life with this person. So I think that's probably where he wrote this. And so another good song. Uh, we'll go on to song number three, True Affection. Supposedly it's an electronic song. And in one of those interviews, uh, Josh said, True Affection is about isolation. I wrote it on tour while trying to woo someone with text message and email and trying to make a connection that way and the frustration of that. So that song had to be synthetic and inorganic and 
Boy, I can relate to that. I mean, I've been single for a long time, but trying to connect in an electronic world where there's no real read on the interaction with the person, uh, that would be quite difficult. Looking forward to this one. True affection, just like I said at the start, a very electronic song, a different sounding song than anything I'm familiar with in his catalog. Like I said, I'm not an authority on his catalog, but I do know you know, a decent amount of it. I like that he chose this method to deliver these words and there's not a ton of words but when you understand what it's about you know it starts out right away with the verse when can we talk with a face instead of using all these strange devices seems like you and i need to have a crazy conversation so can we please stop talking on these things and on these keyboards and everything else let's actually have a conversation and if he felt this way in 2015 or probably when he wrote this in 2014 because it came out early in 2015 imagine what he would feel like now in 2021 when the world of online dating and ever technology has exploded we can just jump on zoom in this covid world and i never even have to sit in the same room with you so uh true affection true affection that that's kind of the whole theme and then the whole outro he just asks, asks over and over when can we talk with a face instead of using all these strange de devices once again though even though it had this instrumentation that was danceable it also had strings it had bass it had a lot of cool stuff in here so i did enjoy how much different this one was now we'll move on to track number four the night josh tillman came to our apartment once again i'll just remind you if you're new to to this material that josh tillman is father john misty couldn't find any research on this but it does sound intriguing the night josh tillman came to our apartment an interesting song, a lot of different opinions on what these lyrics mean that I was reading. It just depends on what perspective you want to view them through. You kind of got to decide before you start reading the lyrics because it's going to form your view of the song. Some people think that it's just about this girl and Father John Misty and then the night Josh Tillman came to our apartment. He's the third person that's referenced in the last verse that I'll get to in a minute that truly there's only two people there and Josh and Father John are the same. But verse 10, I just love the kind of a woman who can walk over a man, and I mean like a blank, it's a word I will not use, marching band. She says like literally music in the air she breathes, and the malaprops make me want to eff and scream. I wonder if she even knows what that word means. Well, it's literally not that. So this woman is very pretentious. She's an intellectual snob, which is kind of the way I view Father John Misty. And I think he's kind of making fun of himself in this song um, in some ways with that. But I, like I said, it's kind of the view you want to take on this. Of the few main things I hate about her. So that's a great line. That's what starts verse two. So he hates a lot of things. It's just a few of the main things. One's her petty vogue idea. Someone's been told too many times that they're beyond their years, the old wise beyond their years. By every half wit of distinction she keeps around and every now every insufferable co convo features her patiently explaining the cosmos of which she's in the middle once again i think he might be poking a little fun at himself or his persona in there but uh a good song a really good song enjoyed a definitely different arrangement than the previous song. We're already to song five on this album. Once again, not really any research out here. When you're smiling and astride me. So I'm gonna assume this is another one of those about Emma, but let's find out. When you're smiling and astride me. Once again, enjoy the ambiance, the instrumentation here. You're having strings in almost all of these songs and just the way it's built. And I know I talked about it in the first song, how he, he was saying how he wanted to just kind of be away from Fleet Foxes so it could be his true self. But on a lot of this album so far, it has a, at least from the instrumentation side, not necessarily the lyrical side, obviously, but the instrumentation side and ambience of this thing has a lot of Fleet Foxes influence in there. Uh, it's a love song, man. That's what it is. It's a four and a half minutes long, but there's only two verses, no chorus, and not very many lines, but it's drawn out. Great little instrumental in the middle there. Nice little instrumental outro. There's no need to fear me, darling. I love you as you are when you're alone. In other words, even with all your secrets or how you really are, I love you, just I accept you with how you are. I'll never try to change you as if I could. And if I were to, what's the part I'd miss the most? When you're smiling and astride me. So that's where we get the title, 
of the song because it only appears this one time. I can hardly believe I've found you and I'm terrified by that because of course when you're really in love with someone it's a wonderful feeling but it's also terrifying if you ever let your mind go to the flip side of that right what if they ever left now that I have this feeling I don't ever want to lose it and it's I've got nothing to hide from you you see me as I am it's true the aimless fake drifter and the horny man child mama's boy to boot that's how you live free to truly see and be seen and that last line to truly see and be seen is how everyone really wants to be but everyone's scared to let anyone in totally into yourself because what if they think badly of me or don't like me so very nice song wonderfully written really enjoyed it now we're to the halfway point of the album there's 11 tracks this is track number six nothing good ever happens at the blank thirsty crow you know, there's a word in there that, once again, I'm you know, kind of talking about, I guess we'll go back to my Christianity. I never preach my, my belief system on here. Uh, that's the one word I will not use. It's a word in the Bible that we are told not to use. I mean, I'll, I'll, drop, I'll drop any other word, basically, in the human language. Uh, I shouldn't, but I will. I'll drop an F-bomb here and there. I'll do all that. It's just a word. I won't go there. And this song is divided into two parts. The first part is a country blues song. Deals with Tillman turning down aggressive women at the Crow, which is a bar in Silver Lake, Los Angeles. Second part is Jazzy deals with men harassing Josh's wife at the Crow while Josh is on tour. I like that little full circle. Named after the Thirsty Crow, it's a Los Angeles whiskey bar. Tillman claims he was, quote, in an effing state when he wrote this song and is disgusted by this version of himself. I hear a very insecure, petulant imp who's objectifying the women he claims to love thinking of her like an object that is his. I have a feeling this is going to be a very well-written song. Let's check it out. Nothing Good Ever Happens at the Thirsty Crow. Song definitely built and progressed instrumentally. Starts out 30, 40 seconds of, it did sound like a country song, little, little country song, not full-blown country song. And he does progress just how the story plays out, like I talked about in the beginning. Living it up, you can have it all, and then it's kind of bragging on his wife and how she's kind of changing, like he could have all these women, but now he really only wants her. Chorus one, he, he goes in, so somebody's throwing themselves at Josh now, another woman. Why the long face, Blondie? I'm already taken, sorry. I may act like a lunatic, but if you think I'm effing crazy, you're mistaken, keep moving. So he's not gonna make that mistake to hook up with this woman when he's in love with Emma. He's not gonna do it. He may act crazy, but guess what, I'm not. Then verse two, the instrumentation changes a little bit there, but it changes more towards the, the second chorus and the outro into getting much heavier guitar. But on the road again, so now, now Josh is out on the road, on the road again for months at a time. Doesn't take half that long for men about town to forget what's mine. So even if the, the people in this bar where they frequented knew that she was married, it doesn't take them long to forget. And, and I'm a guy, I know it's, this is not me, but a lot of guys that I've known over the years, they don't care that she's married, right? Husband's not around, well, who cares then? Now my genius can't drink in silence. She's got to listen to you. So talking about his wife, she's got to listen to your tired ass lines. I know it's hard to believe the good hearted woman could have a body that that didn't make your daddy cry. So even though she's quite attractive, she's also quite faithful. And then course two, Josh is addressing to the guys that are trying to pick up his wife. Why the long face jerk off? Your chance has been taken. Good one. You may think like an animal, but if you try that cat and mouse ass, you'll get bitten. Keep moving. Don't be messing with my woman or I'm coming after you. And now we're up to track number seven, Strange Encounter. Strange Encounter. I'm a broken record a little bit on this, but uh, the arrangements are just fantastic on this. Strings on everything. Um, I mentioned during the song when it started, we got some congas, some lap steel guitar. Not super prominent and mixed in there just evenly in it so it doesn't stand out, which is actually a great technique. I thought he sounded fantastic on this. His songs are not songs that are gonna be catchy with anthemic choruses, right? That you're gonna go around, they're gonna go through your head and you're gonna sing over and over again. Um, they're, they're good stories and, and this is one of those, but it did have a little bit of a catchiness to it, which made it stand out for me a little bit, but it starts out, so this girl must have come to his house and she's drunk or high or both or whatever, but he says, you all, You'll only ever be the girl who just almost died in my house, half naked looking through your telephone, run you a bath and try hard not to freak out. So he's obviously um, trying to sober her up. 
in the chorus. He's like, don't be, don't be my last strange encounter. The moment you came to, I swore I would change. So did he have something to do with her, her being in that state? Though neither one of us would leave unscathed. At least we'll both go on living. So she made it through. He's not going to be blamed for anything. Did he give her the drugs? Did he give her what she took? I don't know. Verse 2. Want to find somebody, but not like this. Yeah, I'm a decent person, just a little aimless. So even though he's not the perfect person, he realizes that deep down he is a decent person. And then it just repeats the pre-chorus and the chorus as we finish out. But I liked the arrangement. Like I said, he sounded really good on this one. It might end up in my favorites. Let's move on to The Ideal Husband. What a title on that one. A few of the songs on this album had brief outlines before Emma came along. It included this and the previous song, Strange Encounter. Though the final versions were significantly shaped by her, he kind of redid them a little bit, making them extremely personal for him. Josh said, just in the practice space, I have a hard time getting through the songs. I have to go back to this kind of painful moment. I can barely get through the ideal husband. That is a nice build up. Let's see what this one has in store. The Ideal Husband, where Father John Misty describes anything but the ideal husband. He starts out verse 1 and verse 2 with Julian. He's going to take my files. I would imagine talking about the WikiLeaks uh, leader. Every woman that I've slept with, every friendship I've neglected, didn't call when grandma died. I spend my money getting drunk and high. I've done things unprotected. I'll let you figure that one out. And proceeded to drive home wasted. Bought things to win over siblings. I've said many awful things such awful things and now now it's out in that refrain so he's confessing to her i think confessing to emma in this case all the horrible things he's done he realizes it right he realizes he's done all these horrible things and and obviously wishes he wouldn't have otherwise he wouldn't have this sort of regret for it starts out verse two telling people jokes to shut them up resenting people that i love sleep until two uh just stay in bed and later lie about it all these little things he's He's very self-absorbed and he's admitting all that. He comes by at seven in the morning. I don't think because he's an early riser, he's probably been up all night drinking or doing other stuff. And then he he ends with some irony in the lyrics. So I enjoyed that one. It wasn't what I expected because he said he had a hard time getting through it. I thought it would have been maybe slower instrumentally, but it worked for this. Once again, a wonderfully arranged song. And now we'll move on to the lead single, Bored in the USA. No, for any scene fans, it's not Born in the USA. Bored in the USA. Uh, Josh called it a sarcastic ballad, and he added a laugh track to the song as a way of neutralizing uncomfortable ideas. Now, he had a famous performance at the 2016 Newport Folk Festival. You can do a little research on that. But here's what he said about this song before he sang it at that festival. I don't know how I feel about this song anymore. It's called Bored in the USA. I think it's a little too late for this kind of S. But if anything, when I wrote this song, I wanted to tell people that it's okay to feel your own pain. Even if it's pain that feels inauthentic to you, you have to still feel it because if you can't feel that, you're not going to be able to feel some exotic kind of pain that some people group that you perceive to be more authentic than you have. So let's just feel our yuppie pain with a song. Uh, that's the kind of pretentious stuff that uh, Father John Misty likes to lay out there. Let's check this one out. Bored in the USA. This is Josh Tillman at his best, in my opinion, because he uses that intellect rather than sometimes being preachy himself or just uber sarcastic. He uses this in a manner of just summing up what the American life is uh, is sold to so many people as how many people rise and say, my brain's so awfully glad to be here for yet another mindless day. Now I've got all morning to obsessively accrue a small nation of meaningful objects and they've got to represent me too. By this afternoon, I'll live in debt and by tomorrow I'll be replaced by children. So we're sold and he gets into it later on. We're sold, especially as me. I'm a, I'm a middle class white man. I am the epitome of of what this song is talking about, that I've got to grow up. There's this great dream of you grow up, you're going to have a house and a, and a job and make money, and that's going to make you happy. And it's not, you're going to be bored in the USA. So he, he's pretty much talking about that. By this afternoon, I'll live in debt. Tomorrow, I'll be replaced by children. Go to school, get in that, that massive student debt, and don't worry, they're going to get rid of you eventually anyway. And then verse two is, is so intelligently written. How many people rise and think, oh good, the stranger's body is still here. Our arrangement hasn't changed. So he's talking about a marriage that is lost 
any sort of uh, feeling in it. Now I've got a lifetime to consider all the ways I grow more disappointing to you as my beauty warps and fades, and I suspect you feel the same. When I was young, I dreamt of a passionate obligation to a roommate. I mean, just a fantastically written verse that you could take from the husband or wife's perspective. Either one works in that. And then the pre-chorus, is this the part where I get all I ever wanted? Who said that? Can I get my money back? That thing we're sold as we grow up, work hard, accrue all the stuff, and then you're gonna be happy. Guess what, that, that stuff's not gonna make you happy. And then he says, chorus one, just a little bored in the USA. Oh, just a little bored in the USA. Save me, white Jesus, born in the USA. Now, I know what you think if you've been watching this whole thing along with me. Oh no, here he goes again on his Christianity. Well, yes, but with a different slant. He's exactly right there. Save me, white Jesus. He, he's alluding to the fact, and as I filmed this in 2021, just lived through four years of this where, it, it's it's held up. Number one, Jesus was not white. So I'm sorry if you're a Christian and you think he was white. He, he did not look like me or you if you're a white Christian. But then it gets awkward because if you're anti-immigration and then those people look like what Jesus actually looked like. So he's he's trying to, to really attack, I think, here how, and it was 2015, this is before what we just lived through uh, in leadership here in America, but it, it perfectly... Uh, was prophetic towards what we were really going to live out in a big time way there. But I think he's attacking, you know, this whole realm of judgmental Christians. And maybe that's what happened to Josh and so many others who don't believe in Jesus, that they saw this church culture that's portrayed today that isn't church at all. It's not the church of the Bible. It's not the Jesus Christ of the Bible. It's about money and greed and manipulation and acting like we're better than you. And that's not Christianity at all. So I do like that line. And then the bridge, oh, they gave me a useless education. So the college degree, hey, I've actually got three college degrees. Guess what? I don't use any of them, So, but I'm in debt on some of them. And a subprime loan on a craftsman home. Dude, you got to own a house. I know you can't afford it, but here, man, we're going to charge you 12%, but, but you're in that home, and we told you you're supposed to be that way. Keep my prescriptions filled, and now I can't get off. Here, you don't feel good? Here's a pill. Oh, here's another one. Here's another one. Oh, now that pill's making you get through the day. Now you can't get off of them. But I can kind of deal, oh, with being, and then the board in the USA, and all of that stuff, and then save me, President Jesus. That can be, you can interpret that a couple ways. Maybe he thinks that Christians follow Jesus, and I do. He is my authority, but I think he more might mean save me president jesus people worshiping their political leaders or their heroes instead of you know whatever their belief system is for me jesus christ but people worshiping other people that never ever turns out well so i know it's been a while breaking that down it's my favorite song of his i've heard so far not just on this album but period because i think he uses that intellect and just crafts a wonderful song now we're already up to the next to the last song holy s i won't say the word because if i do youtube's algorithm searches for profane words and eventually they flag the video as adult and then it doesn't really get seen Josh said he wrote this song on his wedding day, explaining, quote, the way that I felt on my wedding day was just so, so wild. To make a decision like that based on something you believe in, to get out of the morass of ambivalence, to live according to endless contingencies and potential mishaps, potential unhappiness is just huge for me. So he's saying, you know, when you make that vow forever, uh, it's not all going to be great times. So let's check this one out. Holy S, very intelligently written song. I enjoyed it. It starts out, he has a signature sound to me, at least on this album. Now, there's other stuff coming in here. You got a violin, you got cellos, you got all kinds of stuff on this song, but he really enjoys the acoustic guitar and, and the piano coming in, boom, to give an emphasis on that acoustic. So that's kind of what you hear in a lot of these songs. And then the other instruments come in and out, but ancient holy wars, dead religions, holocaust, new regimes, old ideas. So he starts his antithesis through each line, right? That's now myth. That's now real. Original sin, genetic fate. All these things are on opposite sides of the, the spectrum. It's important to stay in form, the commentary to comment on. He's going to get back to that in a minute. And of course, oh, and no one ever really knows you and life is brief. So I've heard, but what's that got to do with this black hole and me? Oh, oh, oh. No one ever really knows you, right? It's, you know, people only know what you let them see, and you might not let them see the real you ever. You might live as a stranger to everyone uh, for your whole life. Age old gender roles, infotainment. Infotainment is taking what was once just straight 
news and now it's got to have this slant to it or this hot take and goodness in 2021 don't we live in the middle of that there's a lot of uh distorting of those things to sensationalize things but he gets back to the chorus again and just the the different uh, dichotomies in in these lines that uh that are just really good in the outro oh and love is just an institution based on human frailty maybe love is just an economy based on resource scarcity what i failed to see is what that's got to do with you and me enjoyed that one as well this album's finishing really strong and on that note let's get to the last song i went to the store one day and this chronicles his and, and emma's relationship and delves into their past present and future bookended by the day they first met in the parking lot of the laurel canyon country store let's finish this album out i went to the store one day and it delves out him and emma's relationship and yes how they met and at the end it, it talks about the very same thing we met in a parking lot i was buying coffee and cigarettes firewood and bad wine long since gone but i'm still drunk and hot wide awake and breathing hard now in just one year's time so very intelligent lyrics because he says i was buying coffee and then later on he says he's wide awake and cigarettes now he's breathing hard uh firewood and bad wine but i'm still drunk and hot so even though those things were long gone just a, a very intelligent way of writing things so he's saying i've become jealous rail thin prone to paranoia when i'm stoned if this isn't true love someone ought to put me in a home so if it's not true love then he is legitimately crazy say do you want to get married and put an end in this so he kind of gets into talking about maybe him and emma used to laugh at marriage or make fun of it now it's like well maybe we should do this he says let's buy a plantation house and what the yard grow wild until we don't need the signs that say keep out so you have the signs that say keep away from us it's just me and her i don't want to be around anybody else once it gets so tall no one's going to want to come up there anyway because it's kind of like oh man i don't know do we want to walk up to this house because it doesn't look very well kept i don't know what's going on inside there but i don't want to know i need someone i can trust to protect me from our seven daughters when my body says enough so he could have been talking about down the line, maybe they'll have a bunch of kids, but he could have been talking about the seven deadly sins too, because with Josh's songwriting, it is very intelligently written, so who knows? Don't let me die in a hospital. I'll save the big one for the last time we make love. So he wants to go out, you know, in a blaze of glory, not in some hospital. And then I really like this insert here, a sentiment re our golden years and he said this i was working on that tune and i just could not figure out what to put in that spot i kept writing this stuff that was like oh in this type of song this type of sentiment goes here it was just all coming out like a fill in the blanks adhering closely to that type of song instead of trying to outsmart it i just had this note written in my book insert here a sentiment regarding golden years and i just ended up singing that as the lyric the way you see me stepping out you see me just being like am i seriously writing a love song that awareness i think is a big part of what i do that helps me live with myself as an artist and as a human being i think that's a fitting way to end this he does he does end all because i went to the store one day i've seen you around what's your name that's how it finishes out and actually emma said that to josh that day in the store and that is going to end out this album my favorite songs are going to be bored in the usa i like the ideal husband and when you're smiling and astride me there wasn't a song now that we we transition into my overall grade i always say this let me give that disclaimer it's hard on a first reaction to really know what you think of an album but with father john misty it's a little bit easier because i mentioned earlier during the review it's not about anthemic choruses or songs that stick in your head not in a bad way he's he's telling stories and so it's kind of like do you resonate with that story how is the songwriting because when you do those sorts of things a lot of the songs don't even have a chorus so when you do that, your songwriting's got to be spot on, right? Because it's really the star. The arrangement on this album is fantastic. The instrumentation, very sophisticated, enjoyed all of that. Yes, if you're watching this, I went in on him a couple times because there's some stuff that I don't really care for that he does. But I also told you at the start, besides that, I can set that aside. Is he someone I listen to all the time? No. Is this someone I'm going to listen to all the time? No. This album is very very good i give it an 8.0 on first rating um i definitely invite you to go check it out and if you do besides just listening along with me pull those lyrics up because 
they become very important. No song is just thrown in there. Every one of them uh, has a message to it. So not Josh Tillman, but patron Josh. Always appreciate you, brother. Thank you for what you're bringing to the channel. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. Let me know what you think of this album down below. And I'm sure a few of you who love Father John Misty are going to blast me. And I get that, but understand on this channel, this is not the type of channel where I'm going to be like, oh, that was the greatest thing I ever heard. Oh, I love this and love that. It's just not the type of channel. It's, it's honesty. It is what it is. You get uh, you get what you get. I'm honest, and I did really like this album. So leave your comments below, and until next time, I will See you.